question, Deep. Thank you very much for having me. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here and um, to talk a little bit about oxygen, the role of oxygen in neurovascular coupling. And uh, also to, to, uh, to answer Tuka's question, I'm also going to speak about hypoxia now a little bit. So we, we did do that. <laughs> we did do that. I'm going to present here the, the research in a few minutes. Uh, I think the most of you will be familiar with the concept of neurovascular coupling, just very briefly for those of you who are not. Uh, well, more, more than 100 years ago, there has been uh, a hypothesis coming up of, uh, by Roy and Sherrington, both uh, very famous physiologists, and they said that the brain is able to, to adapt its blood flow in response to neural activity with high uh, temporal and spatial resolution. And, uh, and this is what we call uh, a neurovascular, neurovascular coupling. And it has become clear in the last year, also true for for the retina. This is one of our very early experiments uh, where we measured uh, retinal vessel diameters uh, during a flicker stimulation, stimulation with flickering light, and you can see the vessel diameter increases uh, during uh, flicker stimulation and it drops back uh, as soon as uh, flicker stimulation stops, indicating for pronounced vasodilatation and also a pronounced increase in retinal blood flow during visual stimulation. And uh, now we, we have learned about uh, neurovascular coupling in the last few uh, years. Uh, and this is data from Eric Newman's group. Uh, Anna Schwenk uh, uh, did a lot of experiments in the rat retina. And uh, it, came, it turned out that things are much more difficult than we previously saw. But this is just to give you an example what uh, Anna and, and, and her team did. They um, applied very small clicker stimuli on the retina, only on spots of the retina. And they saw that you have an incredible increase in blood flow only in the spots that it illuminated, whereas the, the rest of the retina doesn't react at all. So uh, blood flow is not only uh, regulated in, in terms of uh, high temporal resolution, but obviously also in high spatial resolution. Well, this is the current uh, physiological <coughs> concept that <coughs> was introduced uh, a long time ago, how this vasodilatation <coughs> is mediated, and uh, people saw that increased neural activity caused by neural stimulation leads to increase in local de uh, metabolic demand of the retina, which then <coughs> increases blood flow, and this is kind of a negative feedback loop which regulated blood flow. Now, in the last few years, Serious doubts has been have been raised that um, uh, this concept is really true, and I, I'm going to speak about that uh, uh, in in more detail in, in a few minutes. So, if we think that is a metabolic feedback loop, what would be potential triggers or what would put it put potential mediators to increase the blood flow need? And this uh, and this uh, uh, was the, 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 the very mainly discussed. Uh, 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 metabolic trigger, this was glucose, so a lack of glucose could trigger the increase in, in ocular blood flow. Hypoxia, and this is what I'm going to speak about today, uh, may trigger uh, uh, the, the blood flow increase, or for example, uh, an increase in local tissue CO2 may, may induce uh, the um, <coughs> may increase in, in local blood flow. Now, oxygen is the hypothesis that oxygen is involved in that is, is very tempting because we know from the literature, and this is the experiments from Bill and colleagues, that neural activity increases oxygen consumption in, 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 in the retina. We also know that oxygen is a very potent regulator, it's a strong vasoconstrictor, for example, <laughs> in retinal and, and cerebral blood flow. So uh, you can well, well hypothesize that, hypo uh, that hypoxia is uh, a, a kind of uh, 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 involved in the regulation of blood flow. So we thought, why don't we try hyperoxia and, 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 and flicker and see what happens uh, with the flicker response. Actually, uh, we were not the first uh, group to do that. This is also from Eric Newman's lab in, in Minneapolis. And Anusha Mishra did these experiments also in the red retina. You see flicker responses under normoxic condition and under hypoxia. These are vessel diameter data. And you see that there is no change in vessel diameter uh, it, sorry, no change in flicker response during hypoxia. If you go to the blood velocity, you see a tendency towards an increase in uh, during hypoxic condition, but this uh, did not reach uh, a level uh, of significance, but I at least think there is a little bit of a tendency towards an increase. So before I come to our results, I want to acknowledge the work of Martin Hammer, 
because he was actually the first one who looked into that in, the, in, in, in a human setting. And he, I'm sure he's going to present these results in detail in, 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 in the next talk, just, just uh, to, to mention that what he basically found, and you will correct me if I'm not correct, uh, uh, an increase in, in venous oxygen saturation during, during, during flicker stimulation. Um, yeah. So what, what we tried is, uh, what, what is the effect of hyperoxia and, and flicker-induced vasodilatation? Well, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty difficult to bring hypoxia in, 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 uh, in, in the retinal tissue because, as you know, the retina is very, very regulated for, for oxygen. So if you apply or if you breathe 100% oxygen, you have a pronounced decrease in retinal vessel diameter and in retinal blood flow. So limiting the increase in oxygen that may reach the tissue. So what we thought is, what we could do is, we could add CO2 in those uh, uh, oxygen uh, 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 breathing gas, so to, to limit the vascular <coughs> constriction or to bring more oxygen in the tissue. And we have shown in previous uh, um, uh, studies that it really works. This is a, a, a paper that I did with Alexander Lux. Uh, well, more than 10 years ago, and you, if you uh, add, for example, 8% CO2 to a poor oxygen, then you can limit the vasoconstriction, you can bring even more oxygen to, to the tissue. So having this was basically what, what we found, and I'm going to walk you through these results. On the left-hand side, you see uh, the mixture between uh, O2 and CO2, on the right-hand side, you see poor oxygen breathing. And these are the flicker responses on the left-hand side here. These are arteries and these are veins. And what, what you can see is very surprising. We have an increased flicker response during hypoxia conditions, both in during, uh, both during the, the um, uh, mixture of O2 and CO2 and under 100% oxygen. We published that uh, uh, about a, a year ago. Well. This is a kind of surprising result, right? <coughs> At least we found that surprising. And, and what do you do if you have re results that you cannot really explain? You look into literature, what other people found. And we looked into the brain because there is also neurovascular coupling. And it seems that the results of the brain and the retina uh, are, are, are very similar. In the brain, it has been found that during visual stimulation, a 60% increase in cerebral blood flow can be observed. But the oxygen consumption increases only by 15%. So obviously, also for, for the brain, there's much more blood flow increase that, than it would be necessary to, to compensate for the oxygen consumption. So, uh, and on top of that, pharmacological blocking of the m most of the increase in blood flow has little effect on oxygen uh, consumption of the retina. This was also published uh, uh, some years ago. So, um, I told you before that doubt has been, has been raised that really a metabolic feedback loop is responsible for the flicker induced vasodilatation. And this is again uh, a data from the brain uh, from David Atwell's group. And what they suggested is that neurovascular coupling is mediated more by a feed forward mechanism, by active neurons releasing signal metabolites, most importantly prostaglandins and arachidonic acid metabolites than really by a negative feedback loop by uh, changes in the metabolic, uh, uh, in the metabolic uh, uh, properties of, of the tissue. Well, I personally think, uh, well, it might be a mixture between them, those two, two mechanisms, but this is, uh, this is still a matter of controversy. So what we tried also, and this would be the next step, of course, that you would be interested, what is the oxygen consumption or the oxygen extraction uh, during neurovascular coupling. And Doreen has shown you how uh, our model uh, to, to, to calculate that. I'm not going to, do, to go to into detail that about that. But we tried that during visual stimulation and I'm going to present you that, this, this, this result. What we did is we uh, did 24 uh, healthy volunteers in a randomized double mask three-way crossover study with three uh, breathing periods, so very, very strong uh, design here. And we did two groups of hy hypoxia, uh, breathing a mixture of 12% O2 uh, and 15% O2, and one uh, of 100% O2. So 
And basically, this is what we found. We, this is very new data we published at, uh, three, three weeks ago. Um, first, these are the, the effects on, on blood flow. And this does not come as a surprise. If we look at, uh, for example, 100% oxygen, we have a vasoconstriction. This is retinal venous diameter. This is retinal arterial diameter. And we have a vasodilatation <coughs> under hypoxic condition. And we have a vasoconstriction under hypoxia. This is what we would expect. So it's also true for the blood flow data. This is blood flow velocity. And again, under hypoxia, we have an increase in blood flow, whereas um, a hyperoxia leads to vasoconstriction and a decrease in retinal blood flow. So this is not very surprising. Well, how about uh, the flicker effects? Well, uh, they are more surprising. This is the flicker uh, uh, was induced vasodilatation in venous diameter and, uh, and arteries, and this is this is veins and this is arteries. And you see exactly the same picture that we, that we had in the study before. We have an increase in flicker response uh, during hyperoxia conditions. So actually, this is the second study that shows that, and well, we start to believe that this is really true. I mean, we have again under hyperoxia conditions an increase in flicker response. Where, whereas you can see then under hypoxia, there is no change in flicker response in terms of, of diameter. Well, of course, what about the oxygen uh, uh, content? And uh, I showed you the, the results of, from Martin Hammer uh, um, uh, in, in, in the slide uh, before. And actually, we, we found the same thing that Martin has found. We found at the venous oxygen content an increase during flicker, whereas in the arterial side, as we expected, there was not a big of a change. And uh, the arterial venous difference uh, decreased under hypoxia. So the interesting thing is now, what is the oxygen extraction under flicker stimulation? And this is very interesting. And you can see on the left-hand side that the oxygen extraction under baseline conditions, so without breathing, just breathing room air, is about 30% uh, uh, by flicker stimulation. So flicker stimulation increases retinal oxygen extraction as we calculated based on our model about 30 percent this is uh, some some higher than than the data from the brain uh, I, I, I told you before that there is an increase about 15 percent something like this in 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 the brain whereas we have 30 percent so almost twice but interestingly you can <laughs> see that here at, at, at the first glance at pretty 100 percent oxygen we have a uh, considerable increase of oxygen extraction here. Well, what is the reason for that? Well, this is very hard to interpret, I think. The problem is that under hyperoxia conditions, there are a lot of things going on at the same time, as you know. Th you, uh, this has been also shown by, by Doreen, this slide. And what you, I, I think that the most important change that we have under hypoxic conditions, that is that we have a, a shift of oxygen from the choroid to the retina. <coughs> and this is very important because uh, this is a, a paper of, of Tess Kornfeld and also from, from, from Eric Newman's group. And what they were looking for is where does flicker induced vasodilatation happen? And they found out that it happens not in the superficial layers, but in the deeper layers of the retina. So if you look at this uh, image from, from, from the Linsenmeyer group, uh, it's, it, it might be the case that the oxygen tension increases, especially in the areas that uh, uh, where the flicker-induced vasodilatation really happens in the in the in the intermediate layer of the retina. So this is just a hypothesis. I don't have any evidence to prove this, but this could be one explanation to I explain our results. Well. This is what we found, basically. Uh, what we can say today is for the brain, neuro retinal blood flow is highly regulated. You know that, interestingly, the hyperemic response and the response in oxygen extraction is uh, of multitude in uh, systemic hyperoxia. What is interesting is we found uh, uh, as about 30% of uh, increase in oxygen extraction uh, due during hyperoxic condition. But the reason for that, at least for me, is unclear. Your attention. <laughs> I stopped that, right? Yeah.